That was romantic. That was what I want when I read a romance book. This is really setting itself up to be my favorite rom-com I've ever read. Eat the Rich, but not Charlie Winshaw. Not him. This is redemption. Okay, this is redemption. This is all I've wanted since the last video. This feeling was what I was searching for. Hello, hi, welcome. Earlier this year, I made a video reading five of the most popular romance books. If you've watched the video, you know how that experiment went. And it unfortunately was not a success. And I basically ended up reading a bunch of books that I really didn't like. So here I am back again to read five more romance books. But this time, instead of just taking people's recommendations and looking at the most popular romance books, I decided to pick the list mostly myself and also get some recommendations from you as well. I asked people on Instagram to give me their recommendations of romance books that they think I would really love based on knowing me and my taste and based on my opinions of some of the books I read in the last video. And so with my choices and some of your recommendations combined, I compiled a list of five more romance books and decided to read them. And today we are here to talk about all of those. Before we get any further into the video, I do want to give you all two quick reminders. First, I wanted to remind you all that my bracelet with Anna Lisa that I made in collaboration with them is available and it is up on their website. I will have a link in the description box to it if you want to go and check it out. I've been loving seeing all of your pictures wearing it. It makes me so happy and I've been wearing mine every day too. So yes, if you want to go and check out the bracelet as well as the necklace, which I wear in pretty much every single video. Both of these are available on Anna Luisa's website. And second, of course, my reading journal, the A Clockwork Reader reading journal, is also linked down below. As always, if you want a good companion to your reading, something to fill in all of the books you read, and also a space for you to be creative, the journal is perfect for that. So yes, just reminding you, the link for this and the bracelet are both in the description box, as always. But without any further ado, let's get into the five more romance books that I read. All right, so first up, I read Seven Days in June by T. Williams. This is a pretty popular book and I've seen plenty of people talking about it on booktube, Book Talk, um, ever since it came out last year. I was really interested in reading this one. This is one of the ones that was both recommended to me by a couple of friends and also one that I had already had on my list of books I wanted to read. It's basically about these two authors who were in a relationship when they were younger and then broke up and then um, have basically been writing about each other in their books for years, then they reconnect with each other, and then the story goes on from there. I just picked it up purely because of people's recommendations, so I was interested to see what I was gonna think. All right, hello everyone. So I'm currently about halfway through Seven Days in June right now. I'm listening to the audiobook, and I really like this one. <laughs> I decided to start with this one because I thought this book would be my favorite one in the video, because just based on the synopsis and based on the people who had recommended it to me, I just feel like this one has the highest chance of me actually really liking it. Plus, the style of this book is a little bit different because it's not really a rom-com. Deals a lot with trauma and addiction and just a lot of like heavier topics. The main character also has a daughter so it's like different. The characters are slightly older so it has a very different vibe than I think um, the romance books that I was reading in the last video at least for the most part. I'd say in terms of the kind of like style I consider it more along the lines of something like a Taylor Jenkins read romance um, where it's less smutty in general and more about the emotions of the characters and just their lives and experiences. And Taylor Jenkins read as as many of you probably know is like my favorite one of my favorite authors and if I were to pick like a romance writer I would pick her but the thing is like I feel like her books are a little bit different because they're not the same thing as like your smutty rom-coms you know so that's why I, I think I typically lean more towards those types of books than like the smutty rom-coms but you know a good smutty rom-com is very fun every once in a while for me too but I think Seven Days in June has more of this style than like a rom-com style so I think that's why I'm enjoying it more. <laughs> if anyone knows what that specific genre of romance is called? Do people just call it also romance? Like is it just romance as well? Or is there like a different term for it? Because it's very different than like the rom-com books. Anyway, I'm definitely really enjoying this one so far. I will say in the first like third of it or so, I wasn't like completely into it. It was just like, okay, definitely not bad by any means, but I wasn't like really invested. And then we got a little bit past the halfway point and I was like, okay, this is getting real intense. The emotions are getting very heightened um, and I'm definitely having a good time reading it. The writing is really good. I really like the writing in this book. The relationship between the two main characters is just wonderful. It's so angsty. It's so intense. The stakes are high and I think so much of that can be attributed to just the writing. Her writing is so good. 
good and she builds tension so well. It's just, oh, it's really, really well done. It's also very emotional. It's definitely difficult to read at times. I'd for sure look up content warnings for this book if you decide to read it because there are some pretty like graphic depictions of self-harm and like addiction. So just know that before you decide to read it. But yeah, I, I am very much enjoying myself this time around. I'm so glad we're starting off this video with a good book. Um, hopefully this trend just continues upward and I end up liking everything or at least the majority of the books that I read in this video. But yeah, for now, definitely enjoying Seven Days in June and I will come back and update once I finish it and let you know my final thoughts. Okay, hello. I just finished reading Seven Days in June. I really liked it. I, that was so good. <laughs> that was romantic. That was what I want when I read a romance book. Angst, drama, working through past trauma together, and also just like peak romantic tension. There was so much good romantic tension. Oh my god. I also love stories that are about characters who were in a relationship before and then for one reason or another things don't work out and then they find each other again. I love that trope. I love that dynamic. That was great in here and oh my god it was built up so well. I listened to the audiobook so obviously I couldn't like mark up the book but I did write down some of the quotes that I really really liked because oh they were they were so good. <laughs> first the first quote I had to teach myself how to breathe again in a world without you. Like, come on. Oh my God, that was so good. I stayed alive for you and you killed me anyway. And then maybe we work better as a flashback. Like, come on. Oh my God. I know I said in the earlier clip that this book isn't really like a rom-com and it's not. It's definitely funny. Like it has funny moments because the writing is witty, it's sharp and it is funny at times. But like the story itself is not exactly funny. It's much more serious, which I, I personally like that. So that's why I definitely think this would be more of my thing and why it was more of my thing. But yeah, oh my God, I just, oh. The tension was so good. The angst was so good. The problems in their relationship all made sense. Every fight or every like reason that they couldn't be together or would be together or whatever, like it just all made sense. She didn't break them up for like stupid reasons. There was no like annoying miscommunication. There was miscommunication, but like realistic miscommunication. It made sense why they were upset with each other at certain times and um, why things played out the way they did. I'm trying to not spoil anything, obviously. Everything made sense because it was realistic and it was honest and like, I want this to be a movie. Like this should be a movie. I also had no idea what like the premise of the story was about and the fact that it's literally about two writers who have been in love with each other for so long that they literally wrote each other in their books and then reconnect with each other years and years later like it oh it's so good it's so good <laughs> what a way to start off this video um i'm so glad that i liked this one i'm so glad that i read it thank you to everyone who's recommended this one to me um you did know my taste well and i'm very grateful because finally i loved one of these romance books <laughs> also like the smutty scenes were so well written like that's what i expect when i'm reading like a smutty scene and i wouldn't say that this was super smutty or anything i think there are like maybe two two like smutty scenes in the entire book. So it's not that much. It's not like fade to blacks either. It's much more about like the emotions of the character plus some of the smut, you know, which is what I prefer. Some people like like just the smut and like no plot, which like live your life, have fun. That's also great. I prefer like the emotion and like the buildup of the characters and their relationship and the angst of that. And like, that is what I live for in a romance book. And this had all of that. So I'm very happy. <laughs> I think I'd give this a four to 4.25 out of five stars. Definitely would recommend it if you're looking to read a good romance novel. Be sure to look up the content warnings because there is some pretty difficult stuff in here as well. But as a whole, such an enjoyable read. Here's to hoping that the rest of the books in this video are also ones I enjoy because we're starting off real high. So hopefully we can meet that. We'll see. <laughs> the next romance book I read was The Charm Offensive. This was a book I knew basically nothing about before I decided to read it. I had not heard about it. It wasn't on my radar whatsoever. So I picked this one up purely based off of your recommendations. Basically, this follows the story of a producer named Dev on a reality show called Ever After, which is essentially like The Bachelor, except it's royalty themed. And our other main character is Charlie, who is the prince or bachelor of this season. He's this tech billionaire from California. And the story is about how the two of them fall in love. So it's very out there. It's a very kind of like over the top fun premise. So it seemed really really interesting and not necessarily my thing, but something that I was very much intrigued by and curious to see how I would feel about it. I think we found it. I think we found it, y'all. I think I have found the romance for me. I am obsessed. 
I was not planning on filming today, so please completely ignore my appearance. I have not gotten ready for the day at all. I've just been working nonstop. I literally just put on this shirt so that I can look semi-presentable. So this is very spur of the moment, okay? I was casually listening to this audiobook while I was doing other work, and I was not expecting this from so early on to affect me this way, and yet here we are. I, oh, I, oh my god. <laughs> what am I reading? I'm reading The Charm Offensive, okay? I, yeah. <laughs> All I knew about this book before going into it was the premise that it's about some reality dating show like all of The Bachelor or Love Island, like that type of thing. And it's a queer romance. Like that's literally all I knew. I did not expect it to also be incredibly emotional and have a lot of representation of like mental illness and anxiety, OCD, anxiety around dating and relationships and for it to handle that so well. That part's great and all and I'm actually very much enjoying it. But do you know what I love the most? They have chemistry. <laughs> The characters in Seven Days of June also had chemistry, but like I said, that book was not like a rom-com. It was a lot more like intense and heavy, and this is like definitely way more lighthearted in general. And I feel like my problem with a lot of the like more lighthearted rom-com romances is that it's just harder to get that like chemistry and that like emotion between the two characters. But this one has it. This one has it. Oh my god. Quite literally from the second the two main characters met each other, like there was just an instant spark and I felt it. You know when you just like know? The, I, I just knew, I just knew. I'm like not even that far into it. Maybe a quarter to a third of the way through this whole book and I already know I am going to love this. <laughs> Shout out to my editor Brandon for recommending this to me. When I asked people for romance recommendations this time around, this was definitely one of the ones that was most heavily recommended, which is why I chose it. But the main reason that I chose it was because my editor also recommended this one. So I was like, okay, if he's recommending it, I should definitely try it out and like can confirm Brandon, I love your taste in romance books so I'm very happy that I'm reading this. Thank you for the recommendation. Oh my god. <laughs> this is what I want when I want to read a romance book, you know? Like I want it to make me feel all the like fun, giddy, like butterflies in your stomach feelings and this is giving me that. I just have to read you this one line because this was the moment where I paused the audiobook, went to my ebook, found the quote, highlighted it and wrote like notes so that I could save it and then turned on my camera and started filming this because I was like I have to talk about this immediately. <laughs> this is the first time that Charlie finds out that Dev is gay. And then he says, you're gonna be awkward about this, aren't you? And then Charlie says, of course not. And then he says, are you gonna freak out every time I touch you now? And then Charlie says, I already freak out when you touch me. Like, come on! <laughs> oh, it's so good! <laughs> For context, also, if you haven't read the book, Charlie also does not like people touching him, so that is why he freaks out when he touches him, but there's also like the double meaning because obviously he freaks out when he touches him because he also likes Dev. So come, oh my god, I can't, I can't even talk about it. It's so good. It's amazing. This is, this is all I've wanted. This is all I've wanted since the last video. This feeling was what I was searching for, and I can't believe it has taken six books to finally get here, but here we are. <laughs> this is making it sound like I didn't like Seven Days in June. I definitely did, obviously. I really liked that one too, but again, it's it's different. I was also looking for one of the rom-coms to make me feel a lot and this is the first one where I'm like I think this could end up being a five-star book. And that's how much I'm enjoying it already and I'm not even halfway through. <laughs> also it's actually funny. Maybe I'll love the other books in this video as much or even more but like right now this is really setting itself up to be my favorite rom-com I've ever read. It's so well written. The chemistry between these characters is immaculate. It's palpable. You can feel the sparks. You can see the heart eyes. Like, I just love it. And uh, ugh, this is all I wanted. This is all I wanted. <laughs> That's it for my quick update. I will probably be back later today with hopefully some more giddy updates. <laughs> All right, hello. So I'm actually filming this clip for a second time because all of my original footage of me finishing the charm offensive is gone. I have no idea what I did. I don't know if I accidentally deleted it off of my computer, but it's just not there anymore. It's not on my memory card. I have no idea what I did to it. And I'm very upset because you're not gonna get my initial like super excited reaction to me finishing this book. So I have to refilm it and I'm very, very upset about it. I'm very sad, but I can't dwell on that too much because oh my God, did I love this book. <laughs> this is hands down my favorite romance book 
I have ever read. I am just so unbelievably happy and so pleasantly surprised by how much I loved this book. I cried the first time I read it. This is why I'm so upset that I don't have the footage. I cried tears of joy, tears of understanding, like the way I felt like this book understood me on some level. This was beyond just reading like a romance book to me. I felt so seen by this in so many ways and it was just so unexpected. Like I was not anticipating this random rom-com to make me feel so much about my own personal experiences and uh, feelings and like the way I think but like wow they like literally put it into words sometimes. <laughs> and yes, if you're wondering, because earlier I was reading the ebook and I was listening to the audiobook, I also now have a physical copy. I literally have this book in three different formats because that's how obsessed I am. I originally had the ebook, then I didn't have enough time to just like read a physical book, so I downloaded the audiobook. So then I had those two, then I finished it, and I was like, I love this so much, I need it. So I bought it from the bookstore, and I have to go back through and like mark up all of the pages and just tab everything. Right now I just have one tab in here. I loved so many moments in this, so many scenes in this. Oh my god, it was so overwhelming in the best way. <laughs> I explained what the story was about, essentially, but I feel like I need to go in into more depth about what it's actually about, because while yes, we have the backdrop of the Bachelor-esque reality show and the Hollywood setting and all of that, what the actual story is truly about is mental health, how our past, how our mental health affects how we act in relationships. It's about discovering your own sexuality in a lot of ways, but it's not entirely about that. That's not like the main focus of the story. I just have to express like how much Charlie as a character meant to me. I was not expecting to like deeply deeply resonate with this like California tech billionaire but my god he makes me feel so seen. <laughs> Eat the rich but not Charlie Winshaw. Not him. The himbo energy that he had was incredible. I, I love him. I just want to give that man a hug. I know he doesn't like people touching him, but if he'd accepted it, I would love to give him a hug because, oh my god. <laughs> and beyond that, and most importantly, in my opinion, was the representation of, like, asexuality. Because Charlie doesn't label himself as anything. He's kind of discovering his own sexuality and definitely feels like he might be ace spec in some ways. It was just so unbelievably beautiful to read about. The way it is written is so good. It's, I, I don't have the words for it. That's why I sound so inarticulate whenever I talk about this book. I don't think that everyone in the world is going to necessarily feel as intensely about this as um, I do or maybe some other people do who felt sincerely represented by this. I still think regardless of any of that, this is an incredible story. Like it is so well written. The chemistry these two characters have with each other is phenomenal. The relationships the other characters have with each other, the friendships in here, like all of it was so beautifully done and so complete. It felt well-rounded and whole. It didn't feel like anything was super rushed. It felt like every character and every relationship was given the time and attention that they deserved. I loved the representation in here as well. Like there were so many characters of different sexualities and so many characters of color. I feel like Charlie's like the only main character who's white, honestly, and it was just, it was so great. The one quote that I do have marked in here. It's not even my favorite one, but it's just the first one that I came across when I got my physical copy. But this is Dev talking to Charlie and he says, you know you still deserve to have this love story, right? And I feel like that's just like a perfect way to sum up what this book really is about. Charlie doubting himself so much and Dev doubting himself so much about the kind of love they actually deserve and ultimately learning that they really do deserve the love they want. And oh, like, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Definitely be sure to look up content warnings if you do decide to read this book because it does deal with a lot of heavier topics from time to time, like panic attacks, anxiety, depression, OCD. So just be aware of that if you do decide to read it. The representation of mental health was, I felt like, dealt with so wonderfully. It was really nuanced and I felt like there were really important conversations that the characters were having with each other about their mental health as well as how that affected their relationships and their outlook on relationships. And so many of the scenes just made me tear up because they just felt so true and so real and I, I don't know how to explain like this this book made me so happy that does not happen very often <laughs> and I, I live for it when it does I will say that my one and only complaint about this book is that his best friend has like a cute like little nickname or pet name for him and she calls him hot ass and she says it way too many times and I'm not gonna lie it is cringy I was not a fan of that that is my literal only complaint that was like the one thing I really didn't like but like besides that it was perfect the pet names that Dev and Charlie have for each other 
that was perfectly fine. The one time I actually like a pet name is when the pet name is Love, and that's the pet name in this book. Okay, people, this checked every single box. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It checked every single box. Shout out to literally every person who recommended this to me. Shout out to my editor. Shout out to all of you on Instagram who told me to read this. You were right, this book is it. Easily five out of five stars. This is my favorite romance book I have ever read. I don't know what could top this. I hope one day something can, but right now, my number one recommendation in terms of romance. Eat the rich, but not Charlie Winshaw because he deserves the world. <laughs> All right, the next romance book that I read was Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This is such a wildly popular book. Emily Henry, I would consider like a household name in terms of romance books. Anyone who reads romance has read Emily Henry and they love Emily Henry. I've seen very, very few people actually not like Emily Henry books. And I read one of her books in the last video and that was the book I liked the most in that video. So I was interested in picking this one up as well. But Book Lovers was a recent release and it's about Nora who is a publishing agent and works in New York City. She goes to this small town and meets Charlie who is an editor who works with her as well and so since it was publishing themed and book themed I thought it would be really fun and really interesting to pick up plus it was so well loved I was very curious to see if I would like it as well this one was already on my list so plenty of people recommended it to me but this was one of the ones I chose myself because I thought there would be a high chance of me enjoying this all right hello everyone uh, we're gonna have to deal with this precarious lighting situation there's a bunch of stuff in my house so I can't like film in my usual spots right now, but I have started Book Lovers by Emily Henry. In my first romance experiment video, I read People We Meet on Vacation, and I decided to choose book lovers this time over beach read because based on people's recommendations to me and the synopsis and just the title of this alone I just had a feeling that I might like this one a bit more than beach read. I'm not sure um, but this is the one I decided to go with for this video. I'm currently like 130 or so yeah 129 pages into it and I'm definitely enjoying it. I still like her writing style. I think it's very light and fun but I think she also does a really good job of going in depth with her characters and actually developing them really well especially in something like a rom-com that's typically pretty like simple and lighthearted. I think she just does a great job of fully developing her characters. So yeah, I've been enjoying that so far. I don't have like any super strong feelings about it one way or another, really. I definitely don't dislike it, but I don't love it or anything yet. I feel like in People We Meet on Vacation, from very early on, I was really, really enjoying it. And then towards the end, I was a bit more disappointed. I have a feeling the beginning of this one's gonna be a bit more slow for me. And then as we get towards the middle and then towards the end, it'll probably pick up a bit and I might like it a bit more then. So yeah, for now it's um, just fine. And I'm very intrigued and interested in continuing to read. Ever since it came out like a couple months ago, people have just been utterly in love. So I'm hoping that it's one that I fall in love with too. The one thing I'm very happy about, um, the two main characters are the same height. She's not tiny and like super small and frail and just like so delicate. And he's not giant and so tall and so masculine. Like they're, they're both like around the same height and the size difference thing is not, it's not a thing in this, which I'm loving. I love that. And also the main character is an older sister and she's on a trip with her younger sister. And as an older sister with one younger sister myself, I'm also enjoying that aspect of the story because I can relate to some of her feelings and some of her experiences. I'm gonna try and make some progress and then um, hopefully update after I'm done or maybe if something really affects me in the next couple hundred pages. <laughs> All right, I finished Book Lovers. As you can hopefully see, I really enjoyed it. Once I got to about like the 150 page mark, I was so invested. I just kept reading nonstop. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things I enjoyed about this most. The main like praise that I would give this book, the things this book does well, it does really well. And one of those things is holding your interest, making you want to know what happens next. She's really good at, I think, building tension and suspense. I felt the same way about people we meet on vacation when I read that one. You just get invested in the story and you just want to know what's going to happen. Happen. And so I think her romances feel really immersive, like you're really just transported into the world of these characters and you are living out this little rom-com fantasy with them. She even talks about this like in the acknowledgements or maybe it's in the like reading guide or something at the end, but Emily Henry mentions that she loves like Hallmark movies and I think that that's the perfect way to describe this book. This book feels like a Hallmark movie where the side characters got to be the main characters. And I mean that as a complete compliment, like it was 
so much fun. It was the perfect balance of the right kind of cheesy mixed with emotional moments where you have real connection between the characters, not just between the main couple, but also between um, Nora and her sister. And then of course the actual buildup of the romance, the tension there, the chemistry that the characters had, all of it was actually there. Altogether, this book is just like a perfect comforting rom-com. And that's how I felt the whole time I was reading it. There were definitely moments that made me like a bit emotional. I think I mentioned this earlier, but Nora being like an older sister, I think I relate to a lot of like older sister experiences. So anytime I read something about older sisters or older siblings, it definitely always resonates with me a bit. So I really enjoyed that aspect of the story. I loved Charlie. I thought he was a great love interest. Like the man was not toxic. Like I can't, I can't point anything out that's why he's fictional like there was nothing wrong with him <laughs> truly the ideal love interest you cannot find a fault in him <laughs> i also genuinely loved nora um, i think i might even like her more than i liked charlie i don't always like the main female love interest because usually she's just some like tiny little delicate flower who doesn't do anything or say anything or ever stand up for herself or she's the opposite of that where she's super like talkative and outgoing and the happiest person you've ever met and it just like kind of makes you uncomfortable if you know what I mean. Those are like the two types of main female protagonists we get and I don't usually like those characters very much because they feel like caricatures a lot of the time and they don't feel like well fleshed out. And this book obviously plays with that a bit because a lot of it is like a play on tropes. Nora is supposed to be the cold bitchy like ex-girlfriend of the main love interest. That's how she describes herself at the beginning and that's like a significant part of the story. So it's playing a lot with those tropes and I really liked that aspect of the story too from like a literary perspective it felt a little bit meta <laughs> um, as if you were kind of entering this like book universe but you're reading a book so you know like a little bit of like an inception vibe it was it was very interesting actually like I said I marked up a ton of pages and there were just like a lot of quotes and a lot of moments that I really liked there was like one scene in particular that I read and I was like that was just so romantic. <laughs> there were a couple of quotes, so let me read you some of the ones I really liked. I read once that sunflowers always orient themselves to face the sun. That's what being near Charlie Laster is like for me. There could be a raging wildfire racing toward me from the west, and I'd still be straining eastward toward his warmth. Like, that's just... oh, Her prose is so good. She's really good at writing, and that's definitely what makes these books worth reading in my opinion. I really like this quote as well. All these years spent thinking I had superhuman self-control and now I realize I just never put anything I wanted too badly in front of myself. Like that, that one hit a little bit too hard. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Oh, the other thing I absolutely loved were the references to Wuthering Heights, specifically the like I am Heathcliff line because ever since I read Wuthering Heights, I've thought about that again and again. That line and also whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. I literally have a scarf with that quote embroidered on it because I was obsessed with that book when I was in high school. So the references to Wuthering Heights in here were honestly a really pleasant surprise for me and I really enjoyed it. But there's this part where she says, for the first time I know what the hell Kathy was talking about when she says I am Heathcliff. Not just because Charlie and I are so similar, but because he's right. We belong. In a way I don't understand. He's mine and I'm his. It doesn't matter what the last page says. That's the truth here and now. Like, oh, I have, I have goosebumps. It's just, it's so good. This just feels like a book in a book that references so many other books too. And that's what I mean when I say it feels really meta, <laughs> but in, in a really good way. And it was just so wonderful to read. And there were moments in it that I feel like could have definitely made me cry. I guess I just haven't been in a crying mood lately. <laughs> so nothing's really made me cry recently, but this I could definitely see making me cry if I was reading it at the right time. Still, I think it's the perfect amount of emotional and sad, but also so hopeful. There was no irritating miscommunication. It wasn't like cringy at any moment. There was like one smutty scene, two-ish smutty scenes. It wasn't like super smutty book for sure, but they were also exceptionally well written. Honestly, I really don't have many criticisms of this. The only thing is that like there's something missing I think for me and I think it's similar to how I felt when I read People We Meet on Vacation. There was just something that wasn't there. It just felt like there was still room to go like a little bit deeper. Like we're still right on the surface skimming over the edge and we still haven't gone down to where we need to go and that's kind of how I feel every time I read her books. This one I liked a lot more than People We Meet on Vacation actually because I think I just really liked the characters a lot more and I think they were even better written. I honestly can't put my finger on what it is precisely but there's just always a little bit of something missing. Like this book is like 
4.25 to four and a half stars for me. It's really close to five, like it could be five, but there's just something that isn't there. And I don't know what that is. I'm curious to know if anyone else feels this way about Emily Henry's books, because again, I really like this. Like I, I would say I love this one. People We Meet on Vacation, I really liked. This one, I do genuinely love. It's not my favorite favorite because I still feel like that one thing just isn't there to push me over the edge to make me completely, utterly love it. But I would absolutely recommend this. It is still one of my favorite romance books I've read. We're three for three in this video so far. I've liked all of them so much. The Charm Offensive is still absolutely on top of everything. That was the best one. But this and Seven Days in June are kind of tied in my head. I like them for very different reasons, but I feel like in terms of quality and the way they made me feel as like what I would want out of a romance book, they're pretty much neck and neck. And I think they're both really exceptional books. The next book I read was Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. This was another book that I picked myself because I'd seen it everywhere on like bookstagram. I just kept seeing pictures of the cover and it looked really pretty. Um, and then I read the synopsis and it seemed really fun and definitely like the type of romance that I might actually enjoy. This is basically a sapphic rom-com about a woman named Delilah who's a photographer who attends her stepsister's wedding as a photographer. And then the romance that she has is with one of her sister's friends at this wedding. It just seemed fun and lighthearted. So I was very curious to know how I'd feel about this. All right, so I just finished reading Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake and it was all right. I feel like I definitely have more of the unpopular opinion on this one um, because I feel like this book is so well loved. Like when I look at the Goodreads ratings, it has like four point something stars on average. Most of the people who I'm friends with on Goodreads have given this like four stars minimum. Like there's there's barely anything less than that and I didn't like hate it at all by any means. I just think it's really all right. I find it really interesting having read this immediately after I read Book Lovers because um, there are some similar themes in both of these, I guess, namely that it's about sisters. Like Delilah Green Doesn't Care is about Delilah who is in her 30s, similarly to Nora who's in her 30s in Book Lovers, going to her stepsister's wedding to be the photographer for her stepsister and she goes from New York City to this like small town that she despises and doesn't want to be in because she has so many bad memories there. Just like how Nora goes from New York City to this small little town on vacation with her sister, even though she is not a small town person and she loves the city. And a lot of it is about like that sibling relationship, that like sister relationship. It is a bit different in Delilah Green doesn't care because she's her stepsister and their relationship is a bit strained and they're kind of estranged from one another. But it is also about the loss of a parent, which is really interesting because that's also a theme in book lovers too. Maybe it's just because I read them right after each other, but there were some parallels that I could draw between the two books. And actually my favorite thing about Delilah Green doesn't care was the sibling relationship, that dynamic, them working through their past relationship, their childhood, everything that went wrong with them and why they are so estranged from one another now. I found that part of the book by far the most compelling and the only reason I wanted to keep reading. To be honest, I really didn't care about the romance. I feel bad saying that, but I didn't. I just really didn't. It wasn't that interesting. It was really insta-lovey, like really insta-lovey. I think in terms of developing the relationship between these sisters and all of her friends who are at her wedding like that whole dynamic was actually really interesting to read about and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Each character felt like they were their own distinctive person and each of their relationships with one another were unique as well and all around in that sense it felt really well-rounded but in terms of the romance I just felt like there was something seriously missing. For me it just lacked depth like I said it felt really insta-lovey despite the fact that these characters have known each other from their childhood they were not friends, they didn't speak to each other, and even if they had like kind of a crush on each other while they were still kids, it still really felt like it came out of nowhere. Not to mention the fact that Claire, like the main love interest who has a kid and like an ex-husband, or were they even married? I don't remember. The father of her child. And they definitely do try and convince you that she doesn't have feelings for him anymore. And I don't think that she necessarily does, but there's so much like unresolved stuff there that we just never go into. And I don't think a relationship of like, I don't know, 13 years, her daughter's like 13 or something years old can be like resolved in literally like 10 days which is the time period this book takes place over so yeah <laughs> i liked both of the characters i liked delilah and i liked claire i just did not really care that much about them together like they were cute when they were together it was just really fast so i just did not feel invested in them whatsoever like i just felt like there was not enough time to fully build up the relationship which is a criticism i have of like i feel like a lot of romance books that i read this one was also much smuttier i think than 
the other three books that I've read in this video so far. And The Smut was actually really well written. That I had no issue with. Honestly, none of it was cringy. But despite the fact that that was actually good and well written, I just... I couldn't care because I didn't care about them being together because I didn't really have a reason to. I didn't see why they liked each other other than just thinking that the other one was hot, you know? <laughs> Which is fine. I just don't get how you're gonna be in love based off of just that alone. The other main criticism I have of this is that I felt like a lot of the dialogue was pretty cringy. <laughs> Despite the fact that I think the smutty scenes were not cringy at all and were actually very well written, some of the dialogue was not my favorite. There was nothing that was like so glaringly bad that I felt the need to write it down. Maybe there were some lines, but it just, I've, I've read worse dialogue, so I, it didn't phase me as much anymore. But some of it was just a little, a little much in my opinion. It wasn't great. Sometimes this happens, I feel like when characters use like really modern slang or um, they make really like modern pop culture references and there was like stuff like that in it. Not all of it was that bad, um, but some of it was just, eh, you know, it just, it takes me out of the experience of like really enjoying this like fun rom-com. Those were like my main criticisms, I would say. But again, as a whole, like, I don't think it's a bad book. I listened to this one on audiobook. So about like the last hour or so of the book, I feel like I got a lot more into it. Things just really picked up. There were higher stakes slightly. It was just more was going on so you had more reason to care so I definitely liked the ending a lot more than I was liking like the middle of the book. It definitely had some good qualities again like I said the dynamic between the characters were all really well written. The characters themselves I feel like were fairly well developed and the writing barring some cringy dialogue was definitely readable and overall I think well done. So yeah I would recommend it um, if you're looking for a rom-com to read. I definitely would rank it above a lot of the ones that I have read. In terms of sapphic rom-coms, I think this is the second one I've read out of all the romance books I've read so far. And it's for sure my favorite of the two because One Last Stop, I was not really the biggest fan of. It was okay, but like, I didn't really like it very much. This I definitely liked more than that, but still I want to find a sapphic rom-com that I like love, love. So hopefully I can find that. But this is still one that I would recommend. It's just not personally my favorite. I feel like some people will really click with this. But yeah, overall, I think I would give this 3.25 stars. I enjoyed certain parts of the story, was pretty apathetic about other parts of the story, and then didn't love certain parts of it. But I feel like some of the good definitely outweighs the like medium parts of this book for me. But yeah, overall, definitely more of a middle tier book, but still something I would recommend because I don't think it's bad by any means. All right, and then finally, the very last book that I read was A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. This is another book that I completely chose myself. A couple people did recommend it to me when I was asking for recommendations as well, but this was already on my list when I was planning the video because I saw this book on TikTok right before it came out. I didn't even see any reviews. I just saw someone explain the synopsis and I was like, sold? I need to read that. It's basically a historical romance novel set during the Regency period with a trans main character that also has references to Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night is my favorite Shakespeare comedy and I've read it multiple times. I've watched it multiple times and when I saw that that was in some ways incorporated in the story it's definitely not a retelling or anything like that there's just some references to Twelfth Night I just knew that there was a very high chance that I would enjoy this also queer historical romance like come on sign me up so yeah I was very very excited about this and I had very high hopes okay hello I am having a moment I am reading A Lady for a Duke I am sitting in my little swivel chair in the corner of my room wearing what I think is potentially the exact same outfit I was wearing in the last romance reading vlog when I was sitting in this chair and I was cry laughing over the Spanish love deception. So it's a real full circle moment for this series of videos. <laughs> but last time I was sitting here, I was laughing at how bad the book was. This time I'm about to start crying over how good it is. <laughs> Let me just read to you what I just read. We're only 76 pages into this book. It's like 450 pages. It's a really long book. 76 pages into this book, and this is what I just read. He wanted to look at her like he wanted to breathe, like she was breath and he was drowning. And every moment of his not looking was a struggle towards the thing he most needed. And then it keeps going and it gets better. How was it possible that she could feel like a homecoming to a man who had never before had any sense of home? Like, come on! <laughs> I've officially melted. This is redemption. Okay, this is redemption. This is the redemption arc that I needed for romance, okay? This is this is what I had been waiting for. Those moments and those lines that you read, which have happened with multiple of the books in this video already. It's this is not the first time that this has happened, but this 
this is giving me Bridgerton season two feels. Like it's so early on into this. Like I said, I have so much of this left. And already we have such a strong start. The connection between these two characters, the chemistry that they already have, their bond, the angst is so real in this one. It is so real. I can tell it's already gonna be so emotional and you know I love a good angsty emotional romance book. That's what I want all the time. I will not lie, I am not a fan of this cover. I don't like people on covers and this one is not my favorite. I'm not sure if the model that they got for the cover is actually trans. If she is, that's great. But like design wise, it's not my favorite thing. So I was kind of hesitant about picking this up because of the cover, which I understand is incredibly superficial. However, I love judging books by their covers and I will never stop doing it. But that's also why cover design exists, to draw people in. In my opinion, this is not the best one. However, the content so far, phenomenal phenomenal and I am so excited to read the rest of it. I just needed to update you all right now because it felt appropriate to do so while sitting in this chair because it really it really just does feel like we've had a full circle moment from the last video in this series because I spent so much time reading so many books that I really expected to love and completely let me down and in my opinion are not the best examples of romance books. But this one, this is it. This is it, people. Oh my god, I'm not even finished. I'm not even a quarter of the way through it. I cannot express how much joy it has brought me that I have at the very least liked every book in this video, but loved the majority of them. Like, no other experiment has gone this well. This is the first time it's gone this well. And I'm just so happy, so happy that I'm not miserable. But yeah, anyway, um, I'm gonna go continue reading and I will update you all again soon. Okay, I officially finished A Lady for a Duke. It was amazing. <laughs> I hope you can see that there are quite a number of tabs in here. Obviously a sign that I enjoyed the book. <laughs> I mean, I guess sometimes it can be a sign that I really didn't like the book because I just want to tab a bunch of things that I need to complain about, but this is not that case. <laughs> this is a case of loving the book and I sincerely loved this one. This was the most romantic, heartwarming, just beautiful love story. I love historical romance. If there's one like subgenre of romance that I'd probably like the most, it would probably be historical romance because as a Jane Austen girl at heart, I think I will always gravitate towards those types of romance books more so than more contemporary romances. So this book really had that going for it. But even apart from that, I have tried reading other historical romances as well, but just like one or two and I never finished one of them. The other one was more of a novella and they never really landed in the same way but this one oh I oh it's so good <laughs> the writing was lyrical and emotional and there were so many quotes in here that I marked up because I just really really liked them and I wanted to be able to go back to them like this quote the capacity in each of us to love more than we hate do more good than we do ill, help more than we harm. Is such understanding really divine or is it simply human? I loved that one. Also this line that Gracewood says to Viola gets me so much. She says, I could never marry you Gracewood, the world, and then he interrupts and says, forgive my language, but his eyes were steady on hers as the clasp upon her wrist, his mouth suddenly full of smiles. Fuck the world, I will change it for you if I have to. Like, oh my God, it's, ugh. It's so good. <laughs> it was so romantic. Oh my goodness. These two are in love, like in love. And it was beautiful to witness. Apart from that, the trans rep in here was amazing. And every review I have seen of this book from a trans reader has been like nothing but praise for the rep in the book. And I can't speak to the accuracy or anything of the rep, but Viola, in my opinion, is such an important main character. Like her existence matters so much. And the fact that she gets to find love and the love that she wants and the love that she deserves with the person that she loves and deserves. Oh my God, it was so beautiful. While the book doesn't focus around Viola being trans, it's definitely a significant part of the story, but it's not really about her being trans. That's just a part of her life. But the story is about so much more than that. This book gave me the like comfort and coziness that I want when I watch a period drama. That's really how I felt reading this. And it truly just felt so immersive the entire time. And I just, I didn't want to leave this world. My one complaint about this is that in my opinion, it gets a little bit too long. After the first half, there were some kind of side plots that I felt like dragged on a little bit too much, or there was just too much information about them. And I wanted more of 
Viola and Grace would, but we were getting more of the side characters and things, which I liked all of the side characters as well. It was just, I wanted more focus on them. And so then it felt a little bit too long. And then there were some moments that felt a little bit too repetitive. That is the only thing that has kept me from giving this book five stars. It just dragged a little bit. But besides that, it was so enjoyable to read. I loved every single reference to Twelfth Night. The fact that this book literally opens up with the quote, do not embrace me till each circumstance of place, time, fortune, do cohere and jump that I am Viola from Twelfth Night. Genius. I, oh my God. I love it. I love it. Another thing I loved about this book is that there's a content guidance page in the very front, um, which is basically like a content warning page to let you know like what's in here and what to look out for in case any of the content in here might be uh, triggering or difficult for you to read. Like this one says that some characters who knew Viola before her transition refer to her dead name or use male pronouns when speaking about her in retrospect, but in keeping with the conventions of the period, this is only in the form of surname and title. Gracewood has a disability to which he and others will occasionally refer using ableist language. There are some references to his suicidal ideation as well as references to drug and alcohol abuse. Some language has been modernized for tone, voice, and readability. Thank you. Why is it so hard or controversial to have something like this in the front of a book? Every book should have this. I would like to know if I'm about to read a really graphic, disturbing, violent, just grotesque book before I read it. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna read it and it's not spoiling what's in the book. I just would like to be prepared. I feel like it's really important for a trans reader who plans on reading this book to know that Viola will be referred to by her dead name occasionally and by male pronouns because some people in the book don't know that she has transitioned and that she is Viola. Why is it so controversial to say that? I don't know, um, but it shouldn't be. So thank you for having a content guide in the beginning of this. That was so refreshing and so nice to see. Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed A Lady for a Duke, but my recommendation to you, if you want something that has those cozy, comfy, Regency, period trauma vibes. It's definitely A Lady for a Duke. This was fantastic. I'd give this 4.25 to 4.5 out of five stars. It was really great, like I said. There were just some moments where it dragged a little bit and there was some modernization of the language, which obviously the author told you about at the very beginning. And personally, I didn't love all of it, but I understood why some of it was changed. There were some moments where the language was a little bit too modernized in my opinion, but as a whole, it was still completely fine. Anyway, highly recommend. This was fantastic and I definitely need to read some more historical romance now. But there you all have it. That is it for the five more romance books that I read. This video was by far out of every experiment video I have made the most successful one because I enjoyed every single book I read. Even though Delilah Green Doesn't Care wasn't my favorite, I still liked it and that's a win for me because every other book in this video I loved and now I have some new all-time favorites, which is amazing. <laughs> so this video was for all of you who have been saying you just want me to finally enjoy one of the books I read in these videos. It happened. It finally happened. And I can finally call one of these videos a success. This has definitely restored my faith in romance as a genre, or at least my enjoyment of romance as a genre, because now I know that there are plenty of books that I will love and will enjoy. So I'm very excited to continue reading more romance books. And there are plenty more that I really do want to read. I don't think that I'll necessarily make another experiment video for them, but I have been considering doing like a ranking every romance book I've ever read video. So if that's something you're interested in seeing, please let me know. There are definitely a few more books I need to read first before I can do that. I have plenty more experiment videos that I'm currently in the middle of filming and currently in the middle of reading books for, so there are definitely more coming your way, but if there's anything that you'd specifically like to see, please do let me know. I'm always open to your ideas and suggestions. Thank you all also for being so patient with these videos. They're really fun for me to make, but they really just do take a long time to film because it takes a while to read every single book and then uh, film every clip and organize my thoughts and edit it and everything, so that's why they're always absurdly long <laughs> and also why they take so long for me to put out but I hope they're worth the wait and I hope that you're still enjoying watching them. If you would like to follow me on any of my social media, all of my links are in the description box as always. Again, also don't forget the link to the bracelet, which is down below, and also my reading journal, the A Clockwork Reader Reading Journal, which is down below as always. But again, thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!